My name is Nancy Mazels, and I'm the director of the Molecular Medicine Program at the University of Washington Medical School. And this is a program that tries to bring elements of medicine and medical training into the graduate education. And we're very lucky to be funded by HHMI, so we have some money to bring wonderful lectures from the University of Washington to the public audience here in Seattle and to the audience at home. And this program is supported not only by HHMI, but by all the basic science departments at the University of Washington Medical School, and also by the Department of Medicine, and we're grateful to all of them. So tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Paul Yeager, who just told me he's been at the University of Washington for 20 years. Before coming here, he was, as you'll detect when he starts to speak, um, originally raised in the East Coast. He was an undergraduate at Princeton, a graduate student in physical chemistry at the University of Oregon, and then, something you might not have immediately guessed, he was in the Navy for seven years. And now he's here. He's currently in the Department of Bioengineering and some other engineering departments, and he's also acting chair of bioengineering. And I first heard Paul talk about five years ago about these uh, diagnostic techniques, and I thought they were just amazing, and I wanted to tell everybody about them, so now we have the chance. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here, and thank you very much for coming live and uh, via video. What I'm going to do tonight is basically give you some motivations for why I'm excited about what I do and why we're funded talk about some of the technological issues that we've been working on for years, and then dive pretty tightly into one particular project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to sort of give you an example of how it works. So I'll start gentle, and then we'll get into some technical stuff, and then hopefully come out of the other end ready for your uh, questions. So the first motivational issue really is about diagnostic technologies. And the 20th century really was a time of incredible development of diagnostic technologies. Um, most of them in centralized laboratories. Most of them required trained personnel to perform those tests. Most of them consumed fairly large volumes of chemical reagents, required large and often very expensive equipment, but often were slow with respect to how long it took the patient or the doctor attending a patient to get the information. So in the middle example there is an example of what I'll call both 17th century or let's say 18th century and 21st century microbiological tools. They haven't changed very much. Engineers have gotten really good at developing things like that thing in the lower right hand corner, MRI systems, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, CT scanners, fabulous, really good technology designed for working in those centralized environments. If it's you, and you have to use this technology, generally you've got to get to that place on top, that medical center, and you've got to go there. Um, if you're a working person, that's disruptive. If you're old and infirm, it can be a very difficult task to actually physically get to that spot. Um, and if you're unfortunate enough to try to do it around 5 p.m. in Seattle, you've got traffic in the way, and you better hope there's a helicopter getting you there. And if you're involved in outpatient clinical research or clinical trials, these technologies are only good if your patients are tethered to the central hospital, but not so much use if you're an outpatient. So yes, the 20th century was great. The question is, what about the 21st century? <clears throat> and the models, I would say, are largely the things you see on the left-hand side, things that were developed in the very tail end of the 20th century, point-of-care diagnostic things, ranging from very simple ones, like the middle one, which might be a pregnancy test kit, to the upper one, an iStat device, which does multiple chemical panels, and the one on the bottom, which is a blood glucose meter. And we think these are very good examples of models for what we'd like to do in the 21st century, <clears throat> where we can do most of the testing at the point of care, whether it's in the emergency room or a doctor's office, workplace, or even at home, where anyone can operate them, and I mean anyone down to young kids if need be, use small volumes of sample and of reagents, which reduces costs a lot, we want disposables in general for a wide range of reasons because it's easier to make them ready 
and you don't have to worry about cleaning them between uses, which is a big deal. Maybe with an inexpensive reader to get the measurements, like on the blood glucose meter and the, um, the iStat. Sample results about 10 minutes. Why 10 minutes? I like 10 minutes because that's about how long I get to spend with my, my uh, primary care physician. And the idea is that instead of it being, well, let's do some tests and come back in a week, you actually meet the person, you say, it hurts here, and the answer is, let's figure out what's going on. And by the time you're ready to leave the doctor's office, you're ready for the next step. That's one of the motivations. Um, rapid data connectivity is something we're very interested in. Today, our cell phones connect us everywhere, so we really want to think about using that advantage that we now have to move the data around wherever it needs to go. And if we can do this here in the developed world, we enable all sorts of new and personalized types of what are called theranostics. That's combining therapy with the diagnostic together. Uh, and engineers will call it a closed loop feedback system. Um, you have clinical trials that you couldn't possibly do because now you can actually make measurements on people in real time, wherever they are. And it can be very exciting for what you'll call field medicine, which means medicine outside of those centralized locations. So we've been calling this for a long time a D2H2 or distributed diagnosis in home health care. We've had this cartoon up for about 10 years now, maybe 12 years, about how we might do this. You think of a, a laptop computer as the central data connecting instrument to which you'd attach audio video links, for example, or implantable instruments like an insulin pump. Um, and what we've been developing is the stuff on the left-hand side, which is physiological sensors, in my case, worrying about fluid chemistries. You'd connect it via the internet to, first of all, a personal database where you'd have your medical records because single point measurements are useful, but they're much more useful when they're used in context with what your normal readings are, what the trends are. Then where does that data go? Well, to your primary care physician for sure, um, specialist as needed, um, hospitals and clinics. Certainly in certain cases, it needs to get straight to the emergency room and to the uh, ambulance. It's, it's on the way to get you there. And then finally, clinical researchers. We would really love to get hold of a lot of this information, and we'd love to be able to provide it. Now, as I said, 10 years ago, it was the laptop. Today, it's the thing sitting on our hips. It's the cell phone. And the cell phone really is essentially the next stage in how we want to get the data in and out. Okay? It's, it allows us to rapidly get in graphic information, move it any place on the planet within seconds. That's a really exciting advantage. We're not quite there yet, but we're beginning to work on that, and I'll talk about it at the very end. Who'd care about this? Well, hospital inpatients, this is already happening to a great extent. Clinical trials of new meds, um, monitoring hospital outpatients, cancer, post-surgery patients, chronic conditions, people who have to be on continuous monitoring because you want to make sure they haven't made a turn for the worse, or if their therapies are working. Um, chronic and critical drug treatment is something we'd like to monitor much better. As people get older, they're on more and more medications, and frequently they interact interact and they also interact with things you eat or drink and we'd like to be able to monitor liver function and kidney function along with the drugs and their metabolites. You'd want to monitor pregnancy, early warning for emergent conditions. So it's three in the morning, it's icy outside and the question is do you want to hop in the car and risk killing yourself on the way to the hospital to find out you had indigestion or do you want to know and call the doctor immediately? It's the sort of thing you could do. And finally, um, one area that we're spending a lot of time on and we'll talk about today is anticipating, preventing, and managing outbreaks of infectious disease. And epidemiology is one aspect of it, but if you're the doctor, it's this. And, and certainly there are conditions, some of which are occurring right now as we speak in parts of Asia, where there are a lot of people all of a sudden without a lot of infrastructure. And those are the places where you get rapid outbreaks of infectious disease. And to manage those, you need to know what it is and where it is and figure out ways to treat it as fast as possible. So what have we been doing? Well, for about the last 15 years, we've been tinkering with something we call now microfluidics. And we got started fairly early in it. So what is microfluidics? Well, it's a set of plumbing that has a pipe where the diameter is less than a millimeter. So it's 900 microns, that's, micron, that's microfluidics. Uh, if it gets smaller than a micron, you call it nanofluidics. So we're in that sort of less than a millimeter, uh, more, than a more than a micron size range. It has a lot of really nice features. It comes from the silicon microfabrication industry. The first people to worry about this were people who made computer chips. And they made circuits for liquids instead of electrons. And it's a really good way to go. We don't tend to use silicon that much anymore, but it's how we got started. It's compatible with small sample volumes. You can 
automate very complex procedures, you can pack a lot of tests into a very small space because you can make very small bits of fluid chemistry. You can integrate all sorts of things beyond just making a measurement. You can move pumps, you can have move the fluids, you can um, integrate detection and processing. In theory, there's a little waste because we're working with a little bit of fluid to begin with, also not terribly many re reagents. In theory, you get much better reproducibility of function than you and I sitting at a table with a bunch of pipetters because you can control fluid transfer errors, you can control just operator errors in lab tech performance. It doesn't matter if it's a lab tech or you or me. It's tough to do things reproducibly day, on, day in, day out, and particularly in environments that aren't perfectly controlled. You can mass fabricate a lot of these things, and you'd say, well, that's great. That gives you the potential for low cost. Obviously, if you mass fabricated something out of platinum and gold, it would be not so cheap. So you have to also think about the materials you're going to use and the fabrication methods to keep the cost low. Um, we've been doing microfluidics now since about 93, and what we've learned is a lot of things that chemical engineers knew a long time ago, which is how fluids move at what are called low Reynolds numbers. Low Reynolds numbers means fluids run side by side and they don't have turbulent mixing, so you put in blue stuff on the right side and yellow stuff over here, and you get blue stuff here and yellow stuff and a little bit of diffusional mixing in the middle, which we can control and study precisely. We can make computer models of these behaviors, which you're seeing here, which are mathematically rigorous, which allow us to design these things. So we spend a lot of time with my engineering-oriented students to learn how to predict the behavior of these systems. And we've done a lot of exciting things with that. What we've done over the last 15 years, partially in our lab and partially with a company that we started up now called Micronics. Micronics is over in Redmond, and they focus primarily on fluidic applications. And I should say I have stock options in them, so I'm doing my requisite duty to let you know that there is a potential conflict of interest, but I'm not going to focus too much on those. Um, we've done a lot of things. We developed early on, even before Micronics, something we called an H-filter, which was a device for essentially extracting small molecules from complicated mixtures without actually having a physical filter, which means it never clogged, so you could run two fluids side by side, and because of these particular conditions, you can put the pink stuff in on the top and the white stuff on the bottom and still get pink stuff out of the top and the white stuff out of the bottom, except for things that crossed the lines because of molecular processes like diffusion. And we turned that eventually into a sensor technology based on the same instrument where this is a pH meter, but we've also used the same technology for making very rapid immunoassays. Immunoassays for small molecules that are complete in about 15 seconds, which is a lot faster than the conventional immunoassays you'll do in the lab. And this was very exciting. It opened up, frankly, a whole range of types of applications where being small was actually a good thing. Not just because you use less stuff, but you, but you could have access to processes that were unique to being small. And that's been one of the hallmarks of what we've tried to do in our group for many years. Um, we've also, with the Micronics people, developed fabrication techniques which let us go very rapidly into stacking up things. And there are students here today who did some demonstrations or did some examples of this themselves, where you can make arbitrarily complicated fluid or circuits cut out with a laser cutter and then stack them up and build up arbitrarily complicated circuits. Some of them as complicated as some computer circuits. This is one made by Micronics, which is part of a flow cytometry system. Um, this is, if the video works, an example of one of the more complicated systems we put together in various of these cutout things cut out with a laser. We take the laser cut pieces, stack them up. They have basically sticky scotch tape layers. There's glue layers on them. You stack them together and you can make arbitrarily complicated circuits out of this kind of technology, which is pretty exciting. And the real beauty of this, and I don't know if I can go back to see the image here. Now apparently it won't show. Underneath this is an image showing there's a $25,000 instrument that we use to cut out these things. So it's relatively cheap, much cheaper than a silicon microfab lab. And my students can go from a CAD design on a CAD program to a finished circuit like this in one day. And not make one of them, but make 16 of them. So we can do what's called rapid prototyping. So we can make our mistakes very quickly and hopefully recover from them with some combination of building and the modeling. Um, just to reiterate some of these things, so what are our, what I'll call laboratory goals? They include making these disposable polymeric laminate systems that can use a couple of drops of an easily accessible sample, like blood, like urine, tears, saliva, feces. And we've been working with all of these things at one point or another. Um, they should be cheap. They should contain all the chemistry needed for multiple 
quantitative bioassays, three long words. Not just one test, but maybe 10 or 20 tests on one card so that you don't just get an answer to one question, but you answer a symptomatic question. And we'll get back to that. Um, we want them to be storable any place because we don't want to have to carry a refrigerator around with us in our backpacks and we want to go into the woods and still have the ability to use these things. We want them simple, again, so someone young could use these things. Quick response, laboratory quality quantification of analytes, meaning we'd like to be as good as the numbers you get in those centralized labs. Today you can get a pregnancy test kit which works fairly well to let you know if you're pregnant or not, <clears throat> but you couldn't use it to monitor a drug level because it just gives you a yes, no answer. We'd like to be able to get quantitative levels of a variety of molecules in the blood. And if necessary, and only if necessary, have some sort of a reader box that handles these sorts of things and gets the numbers out. And that's where we're going to be going today. Now, most of what we did, I confess, I grew up in the developed world and I thought about the problems of the developed world first. And for many years, people were saying, you need to go talk to those people at PATH. And one of these days, we actually had a student in my group who introduced me to people at PATH, and I've been hooked ever since. And I've been hooked for a number of good reasons, not the least of which is sometimes it's easier to solve the harder problems first. And in a sense, this is the harder problem. It turns out the developed world isn't the only place where technological fixes can work. And I'll use the example of the cell phone as a place where technology has penetrated incredibly effectively into the developing world faster than you could have believed, in part because everybody wants to talk to everybody and in part because a cell phone network is so much easier to build than a wired network of the sort that we built here 100 years ago. You leapfrog technological steps in certain places. Problems of health in the developing world can rapidly become everybody's problems. So it's not like we can say, well, that's their problem. We don't need to worry about it. We don't need to think about malaria. Well, if you've got troops who are operating in a place where there's malaria, guess what? They're going to come home with malaria and get it while they're there. On the other hand, if you're thinking about the developing world, they don't have a lot of money. It's the simple, most basic fact. So if you have a solution, technological or otherwise, it has to be inexpensive. Not cheap in the sense of doesn't work well, but inexpensive, not costing a lot of money. So we try to focus, whenever possible in my lab, on technologies that could be inherently inexpensive. Inherently, meaning we don't want to build things out of platinum and gold. We don't want something that can't be made into a cheap disposable that could be affordable to both the developed and the developing worlds. Um, well, there are lots of interesting things about the developing world environment that are somewhat different. And I don't have to read all the details, but this is a, a lovely hospital in New Delhi. Uh, the Ames hospital system is really very good, the All India Medical System. And it'd be a great place to have your appendix taken out. You go a few miles um, out of Delhi into the countryside, and you get to things that look OK, but when you go inside, and I, these aren't pictures I took, these are pictures from colleagues of ours on this project um, at PATH, and you begin to see the lab conditions are a little bit different from what we've got here at the University of Washington. Um, you know, the cleanliness may be as good as it can get, but there are limits, and things are old, and they're run down, and they don't have a lot of equipment. This place is lucky enough to have electrical power, and if you look carefully on the floor, you'll actually see a battery carrier. So they actually have batteries which they convert to AC current with an inverter for the many, many times during the day when there is no electrical power. And that's a very common situation, even in urban <clears throat> centers in the developing world where they ration power. Yes, they've got a microscope and a centrifuge, but not much else, okay? And not much money to buy anything else, and it's very difficult to bring in supplies. Um, and if you want to get supplies, how do they get there? And this is a very good example of an Indian laboratory supply courier service. These things are transported in boxes. It may be 40 degrees C in the summertime outside. That's in the hundreds. It's extremely hot. So you cannot necessarily rely on things staying cold to get there. The sort of things we tend to expect in laboratory supplies really don't apply in a lot of these places. So you really have to think about how you're going to handle getting things to a location if you're going to use disposables. So the technical issues are not all technologies are appropriate for the developing world, at least not the ones that exist now. Um, there are a lot of diseases that are very, very common in the developing world that don't exist in the developed world at all. We wiped out malaria in the US a while ago, and I thought we had gotten rid of dengue, except apparently it's coming north through Texas. I hear Texas is beginning to get dengue again. That's not a disease you want to get. Um, and a lot of things are coming in through the borders and will continue to come into the borders, whether brought back by natives or people coming across the borders illegal. There's going to be a lot of interesting diseases, particularly as we have climate change on top of everything else. Um, the infrastructure in the developing world for technical things is generally not very good. You often don't have highly trained people. 
um, whether they're nurses or diagnosticians, power is flaky and supply chain can be very hard to work with and commercial reagents are sometimes not reliable anywhere. There are lots of non-technical issues and I must say that I've gotten an enormous education in the last three and a half, four years about the non-technical issues that are involved in this. One is very simply poverty. When you don't have money, you can't buy a lot of stuff. You can't simply go to the store and buy the same things you and I could pick up in the drugstore. Um, you're often reliant on philanthropy and, and foreign aid. The burden of disease can be extremely high in many areas. I mean, I was in a, at a, um, a camp which is known as a township in South Africa where the HIV rate was 29% and that was considered to be low for some of the townships in South Africa. So essentially almost everybody's down with HIV and TB and several other diseases on top of that. That's an altogether different system for circumstance than what you have here where most of us who are walking around are relatively healthy. Um, it's just a different scale of dealing with disease when you're in a situation like that. Um, often you can't get production facilities to make things in the developing world. Um, you may be dealing with an unstable or corrupt political infrastructure, which it makes it very difficult to do business. In certain cases, you have regulatory and intellectual property issues that are severe. And finally, you can have civil wars in countries which make it impossible to do anything and everybody has to pull out. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So today, we're doing three diagnostics projects in my lab. The first is supported by NIAID, that's Allergies and Infectious Disease, part of NIH. And this is with PATH as primary. Um, and Micronix is a subsidiary, we're a subsidiary as well. It's a system that uses polymerase chain reaction, that's a nucleic acid amplification system, for detecting pathogens that cause diarrhea. Diarrhea kills a lot of people in the world. And it turns out even today, if you go into the hospital with diarrhea from what actually was an E. coli 017 outbreak, they'll still run a culture and it'll be two and a half days before they know for sure that's what's causing it. At which point you're either walking out of the hospital or you're very severely sick or dead and it's too late to do anything about it in many cases. So we're working on a project to try to use PCR to get rapid, immediate diagnostics for people within half an hour that says this is what's causing it, here's what the treatment should or should not be. Um, we're also working on a project funded by another branch of NIS, NIH called NIDCR for using saliva as a sample for monitoring small molecule drugs. And that uses an immunoassay, which technique we'll talk about a bit more. And then finally, we have this project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which I'll talk about for the rest of our hour, that focuses on point of care diagnostics that uses both PCR and immunoassays combined in a single system, which we'll talk about. So this has a cute name, and the cute name came from a guy at PATH who we, we, we asked for it instead of names, and we decided this was it um, as our best name. The capital D lowercase x is used by people in the medical world to describe diagnostics, just like Rx is therapeutics. Um, on the other hand, we were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and they sell a product known as the Xbox. So we thought the concept of, uh, you heard that I was from the East Coast, well I'm actually from New York and um, if I was a New Yorker and I wanted to go down and buy an Xbox for my kid, I'd say, Where, which shelf is the Xbox on? <clears throat> so um, we like the idea of the Xbox. We call it this, it is, I should point out, a title that we're using for the internal project, and we use this name a lot. We suspect that when it becomes a clinical product, which we hope to occur within two years, it probably won't have that name because of the overlap of the name with the Xbox, and that's a whole other interesting lecture. Um, it came out of a program called the Grand Challenges in Global Health, funded by the Gates Foundation. <clears throat> this was an attempt to identify the 14 most serious technological problems that could, or I should say problems, that could be overcome by technological fixes. And some of them are related to vaccines, some of them are about nutrients and food, and there were a couple on diagnosis. And we've got one, two grants here. One of them is actually um, going to um, Chris Murray at um, the, his center uh, at the University of Washington. And one of the other two ones in diagnostics is ours, which is this, um, a system for rapid diagnosis of diseases for use in the developing world. And that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the time here. First point is, I'm the principal investigator. That doesn't mean I do all the work at all. It means I sort of herd cats, mostly, and our cats include several types of organizations. Two companies, one nonprofit, and two university faculty members. Um, I'm running a bunch of the immunoassay development. Pat Staten in our department is working on biomolecular systems development. Um, Nanogen is working on nucleic acid assay development, um, the branch of Nanogen that's up in Bothell. Um, Micronix, the company that we had a hand in starting up, um, is actually 
integrating systems and is working with a subsidiary called Invitec in Australia on the instrument design and build of the whole system itself. And PATH um, is organizing assay validation, meaning finding us the right assays to work on in the first place, UNA, which we'll describe in a minute, and then systems testing. And it's a, we meet every week. Well, we have teleconferences every week, and we meet every four weeks. We have one tomorrow, and we've been doing it for two and a half years now. It's a lot of people, okay? It's a lot of people in various organizations, and this list keeps changing and keeps getting longer. So it's, it's a, I don't think we've ever had everybody in one room at the same time, but we're getting pretty close in some of our meetings. Um, so what are we trying to build? Well, with this DXbox thing, we had an idea of what it was going to be, and I'm going to tell you what the ideas were. And very early on, we had to build a sort of wooden block model to say what it ought to look like, in part to take it to other places and say, if you had this, would it work? And we'll talk more about that. Um, so there are car keys there for scale, and those two plastic things are meant to be the disposables. It's a platform. Okay, what does a platform mean? It means it's not a test, it's a set, it's an instrument that could allow you to perform different sets of tests. But we had to focus on one thing as a starting point. And what we focused on as a starting point was to diagnose, in this case, six pathogens by two different methods at the same time. One sample, looking for six different things in that sample, and doing it by two different methods on, at the same time. Okay, all within reasonably short time. PCR, again, that polymerase chain reaction for amplification of nucleic acids, and immunoassays for detection of antigens from pathogens and antibodies to find out if your body is responding to those things, which sometimes is a better way to go. We aim for a turnaround time of 15 minutes per sample, um, as well as the idea of going all day, um, one after the other with disposables. Disposable containing all the reagents, all the wet stuff, all the fluids, and the box itself was meant to stay completely dry. It would have air and power and electronics, but no liquids would stay in there, so we never had to refill bottles in the box. We wanted to have an on-card calibration, which meant that you don't have to take it down to the shop in the morning and calibrate it and then take it out of the field, but you'd be able to do it wherever you were at any time when you're ready to make a test. It needed to be small, so you could think of backpacking this thing. Um, lightweight, so it wouldn't kill you if you backpack this thing. Rugged, so that it can be used for long periods of time in less than perfect situations, not on perfectly flat surfaces, bouncing in the back of a Humvee, for example. Battery powered, so that you would not need to rely on batteries, so you could run out into the field and do this wherever the patients were, including in a small village somewhere under a tree. It needed to be simple, because the end users we were aiming at were people who were at the very far end of the medical care delivery system in the developing world. So not someone with a PhD, certainly not someone who developed the box, but somebody who may have some rudimentary training whose primary focus is not on doing cool diagnostics, but giving the medication to that patient right in front of him or her as fast as possible so they get better. Low cost was absolutely central. How low? Well, we're thinking on the order of $300 or less for the box, which can be used hopefully for five years at least, and then probably pennies per disposable. Okay? Maintenance has to be virtually nil, maybe cleaning periodically. Um, that's a really tall order. Who might use this? Well, in the developing world, we're certainly thinking about the people on the top of the list. Small urban and rural clinics like the one I showed you in India, um, but it would include disaster and healthcare workers. Um, sadly, they are always needed in a variety of places around the world when things get terrible and there's just, you know, literally you're getting things in with airplanes and helicopters. You don't have a lot of weight. You have to get things in quickly and get the answers as rapidly as possible. Um, oh, and I should point out that yes, eventually we think the same technology could be used in the developed world, but they're secondary and not on the radar for the Gates project at all. What are our first targets? Well, we worked with PATH to figure out what we would think would be a good panel. And the panel was meant to say, let's take a symptom. A symptom is a rapid onset high fever. And in the developing world, we were, it was explained to us by the PATH people that these six different causes of fever could be indistinguishable at an early stage of, of, the, of the disease. So we went after the sources for dengue fever, measles, influenza, malaria, typhoid, and rickettsia, all things that are found in the developing world, um, although not necessarily all in the same place at the same time. But many of them are found, as it turns out, simultaneously. What's interesting about this set is it includes three RNA viruses. So in that case, you're probably going to look for the RNA if you're looking at nucleic acids. You've really got no choice. You've got, and I don't want to call it a eukaryotic. It's, um, it, malaria is an interesting beast. It has one slightly complicated phase, but basically it's a single-celled 
um, protist, and then two bacteria. Um, so we had the choice of going DNA or RNA for the bottom three, but we decided to go with RNA in general with all of them um, for the RNA detection or the nucleic acid detection. And we're also, in the case of malaria, um, looking at plasmodium falciparum, the most dangerous form of these, where we have two antigens we're looking for, one which is specific to plasmodium falciparum and one that's pan um, plasmodium. In all the rest of the cases, we're looking at IgM. So we're looking at serology assays to see how things are working. The challenge was to do this in a couple of drops of blood. And it turns out we've learned a lot in the past couple of years. Some of the things that probably merited a dope slap or two to the head, like it's really, really hard and maybe impossible to do influenza with, with a blood sample, no matter how big it is. It's an interesting problem. The only cases that we know of where it's going to be easy to do that, unfortunately, is bird flu. And that's a very, very rare case. So it's not one we're going to be doing with blood. But why would you want to do both nucleic acid and, and um, antigens? Well, this is a, not our data. This is from a, a study done in Sweden of Swedish travelers returning from a place with high fevers where they thought there was a pretty good chance they had dengue fever. And it turns out what they were comparing was, and if you can see this up here, there's the PCR response, which is looking for nucleic acid. This is basically viremia, the presence of virus in the blood. And those are the open squares over here. So at day zero to one, there's a lot of virus in these people. So you see a viral response, so you can see nucleic acids. On the other hand, by greater than five days out, there's no longer any virus present in blood. Your body has cleared it. You're still sick as a dog, and you want to know what it was causing, but you're not going to find any more virus in the bloodstream. On the other hand, if you were looking at serology and looking at IgM, initially on day zero to one, there's none. Your body hasn't responded yet. But over those five days, your body builds up an initial immune response using IgM. So at the five-day point, you can easily detect dengue with the immunoassay, but not with the nucleic acid test. So by combining the two, you can cover those first five days of the rapid onset fever and know that you have a positive hit for the particular agent that's causing it by combining these two. Now, this isn't true for all agents and all diseases, but it's a template for how we want to operate. And whenever possible, combine an appropriate immunoassay with an appropriate nucleic acid assay test. For some diseases, one is much better than the other, and you wouldn't use both. But we're starting out with six and six in parallel on the same card. When would you use it? Well, at a variety of stages. It turns out, obviously, at the very earliest stages, an infection, and when you begin to get nucleic acid detectability, it'd be great. As soon as you can start treatment, the better. And of course, in certain cases, we're going to use this not to cause treatment, but prevent treatment. If someone comes in in a malaria, um, indigenous area where you've, or endemic area when you have a lot of malaria and everybody assumes you have malaria. Well, it turns out if you don't have malaria and you give somebody antimalarials, you're not helping the person. You're actually hurting them in a lot of ways. So often simply ruling out a treatable infection is the best way to go. Um, we're not going to initially look at IgG titers. They're very helpful for some things, but they basically say you had a disease, this disease, a while ago. It's really good for um, epidemiology. There may be other versions where that's going to be the primary use, but we're not looking at that initially, but it could be done later. So what is it going to do? Well, we want to keep it really simple. So the, this is sort of a flow chart of what you would have. Start out with a finger stick, a couple of drops of blood, put it on the disposable card. We'll probably use a little stylet down here, which you can see, which will suck the blood up and then you'll squirt it onto the card, at which point you shove the card in the machine, hit run, and wait 20 minutes. And 20 minutes later, we believe it's going to say malaria, yes, dengue, no, you know, um, rickettsial disease is no, and it'll give you yes, no answers. We'll talk about why it's that simple, and it largely comes from the end users who don't want to know much more than that. So there's an algorithm you have to come up with to how to decide that. What's it going to do? Well, on the left side here, we've got immunoassays. We'll be cleaning up the samples, um, taking plasma on this side and doing immunoassays using absorbance imaging. And I literally mean imaging, um, if I can do this without taking the wires off, the camera in your cell phone is ex almost exactly what we're going to be using inside this instrument. Turns out they're dirt cheap these days because they're made in such huge numbers and they're plenty good for imaging things and looking at dark spots on light backgrounds. So we're going to use literally the boards from cell phone cameras because they're cheap and they do exactly what we need to do. On the fluorescence side, we're using a slightly more complicated fluorescence measurement, but it's actually only two channels at once. So it's very, very simple and very inexpensive. So the readouts had to be very, very simple and moderately different from how you do these assays in the laboratory today. So ideally, 
You put the blood on the card, shove the card in, and out comes an answer with nothing more than a start button push on it. So who are the, the various teams doing? Nanogen is working on nucleic acid development. They are, uh, have been in place for many years developing um, a variety of primers and probes for detecting a variety of sorts of um, nucleic acid targets. They've now gone through a variety of iterations as we've adjusted the system through, I think, seven different versions of the primers and probes to adapt to what we're finally doing. Um, and using a variety of in-house components and, and capabilities they've got here, this is a fairly old chart, but it gives you a hint of where we were in the fall in terms of biplexing the assays. For those of you who know what this means, every one of the assays has to be confirmed. So if it's a negative, we know it's really a negative. So what we're doing is we're looking for a housekeeping gene in blood in every single one of six separate channels so that you know that they actually functioned mechanically. That blood went from the finger stick all the way to the end of the line. So if it's negative, it means there really is no nucleic acid in that person's blood sample. If it's positive, you expect to see a signal and you'll see the internal control as well. So that's the only time you ever say you've got a positive. And it turns out, you know, what you want to do is get these things as sensitive as possible. And it turns out to biplex an assay, you have to adjust concentrations and the exact primer and probe sequences. And they were able to get these things down to single copy sensitivity in vitro using a conventional system. Once we stick them in the card, things get a little more tough. But basically, it's as sensitive as any PCR assay out there, and all of them are. Pat Staten's lab is actually working on sophisticated new molecules that will enable us to do things we can't do today. He's designing polymer protein hybrid molecules that allow us to do very interesting types of target capture to pull out low concentration samples. We might eventually be able to do influenza and blood using some of Pat's technology. Um, passivating the surfaces, which means making sure proteins don't stick. And finally, working on dry reagent storage. That turns out to be the way to allow those things to tolerate sitting in the 40 degrees centigrade for a year. And that's really our criterion. If we can't have it storable at 40 degrees C for a year, it's not ready to go out to the market. So we're pushing that very hard. PATH is doing a lot of things, as I said. And one of the most interesting of these things, in many ways, is what we call UNA, or user needs assessment. This is effectively a marketing study. When the Gates Foundation funded us, they didn't just say, go do some research and come back in five years. They said, and you're going to tell us how this product is going to end up actually on the market in the developing world at a cost that's accessible to the people at the bottom of the food chain. That was a pretty major accomplishment. And the first thing we had to say was, well, what do they want from us? What is it that we, they will actually buy or that the countries will buy and distribute for us if we can make this technology work? So they actually did user needs assessment studies in three places. India completed in 2006, Brazil in 2007, and the Kenya study actually, it says pending, it actually just came in three days ago. We finally finished it. You might guess why it took a longer time than expected to work in Kenya. It turns out that PATH has a lot of personnel on the ground in Kenya. And it was a perfect place to work. They had a great site in Kisumu, um, in inland in Kenya, as well as people in Nairobi. It has, it's endemic for enormous numbers of sub-Saharan African diseases, including HIV, um, it was a fascinating study, and it was also the place to work because it was the most stable democracy in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Except then all hell broke loose around Christmas time. So the answer is the best laid plans in terms of figuring out how to get information out even can, can really suffer when you actually deal with the real situations. Um, hopefully things are stabilizing. The people are now able to go back to work, so things are, are, are stabilizing out in Kenya. But it, really highlights the problem of how you're going to actually deliver medical care there and medical technologies. Micronix, the company in which I have the stock options, is responsible for multi-analyte integration, putting together nucleic acid tests, and as well, the bottom line, a really exciting one, is the commercialization, which is very, very tricky and very involved, and we spent a lot of time on that. Um, I'll tell you the story about the nucleic acids briefly because it's, it's kind of interesting. The nucleic acid testing stuff was originally meant to use PCR. PCR because it came off patent this year, so we now have access to it without having to pay large amounts of royalties. It's a really good technique for nucleic acid amplification. And they first came up with this technique to build a plastic card and put, load it up with six wells and put it on an instrument they built, which has what's called a Peltier element, which is a heating and cooling device. Those of you who have had those coolers that will keep your food cool that run off a battery and a fan, those have a Peltier element, which allows, it's called a heat pump type technology, but it's a solid state heat pump. It's really great. But if you ever own one of those things, you know the batteries don't last that long because it turns out it's a real hog for power. 
it works great, it cycles the entire container, but it works, and in fact, it was very fast. In fact, it was seven seconds, sorry, seven minutes for 40 PCR cycles, which is really good. It's extremely rapid. So we thought, this is great, but the problem is it's a power hog. It just was unacceptable for this particular application because we needed to run all day on batteries. Um, so we said, uh, uh, not gonna work, and we went to plan B. And plan B is on a card that looks a little bit like this. The part on the bottom is actually the nucleic acid isolation and separation stuff. The top part is a series of wells that are held at different temperatures, and then using pneumatics, we're shuffling things back and forth between various holes, and I'll show you what we're doing. Um, now we're moving the sample through different containers that are held at fixed temperatures above ambient. It turns out the beautiful thing is PCR runs at temperatures above room temperature. And if you're at 40 degrees C, fortunately all those temperatures are above 40. So you can work with this on a really hot day in sub-Saharan Africa. And you don't need to cool, at least don't have to cool actively. So that was the beauty of the system. So we said let's run things up to these temperatures and move the liquids instead of heating and cooling and heating and cooling. That saves an enormous amount of power, as it turns out, because the, moving the liquids takes very, very little power. Um, it's about the most efficient way to do this. And let me show you roughly how we, we do this. So the idea is now there are four, basically, copper blocks in this thing. When you wake it up in the morning, they're at room temperature, whatever that is. Um, in fact, there'll be six of these little lines in parallel. I'll just show you one line. So you insert your card. Your card's at room temperature, whatever that is. And the next thing you're going to do is you're going to warm these things up to the following temperatures. Okay? So you'll use a lot of power to warm up those things the first time you use the instrument. But then you can simmer at that temperature, and ideally you have to put in virtually no power at all to keep them to those temperatures as long as they're well insulated. So then you insert the sample, you run your reverse transcriptase, and it turns out you can do it all at 55C. Our target is 2.5 minutes. We've achieved that off card. We think it's about five minutes on card. We're trying to shoot for 2.5 total for the reverse transcriptase part. That's the part that converts the RNA into cDNA. Then we basically deactivate the enzymes at 95, and basically we start shuttling back and forth between 56 and 95, back and forth. So it's a two temperature PCR, works fine. Works great. Run it through about 40 cycles. Um, fast amplification's complete. Um, sorry, to, oh, I'm going backwards, excuse me. <laughs> that would confuse anyone. And after you finish those cyclings, Target is about seven minutes. Right now, we're at about 15. We're going to try to, we're still adjusting the parameters to try to get it down that far. Finally, you move it off to the 55 degree block, um, and you detect the two wavelengths for each one of these channels, and then you ramp that one up to 95C. So that one goes up. And what you're doing is you're melting the DNA and looking at the change in fluorescence. So you're doing a two point measurement instead of a real time PCR, and there are a lot of reasons we're not doing that. It turns out it works really accurately and very effectively. And those numbers you saw for detection were actually done with the two-point detection earlier from Nanogen. So it, it works, it works off card really well. We're in the final stages of adapting it on card right now. These are just examples of the temperatures that you measure in those two sections as you're shuttling back and forth between the high temperature and the low temperature PCR. It shifts the temperature a little bit because the liquid has thermal mass as you move it. It's calculable and measurable and we're working on that. And it's a great both, it's a really good engineering problem to optimize it. Um, this was at an early stage when we were doing, just demonstrating 10,000 copies on card. These are gel strings. These, this particular amplicon over here is in fact, um, this is one from PFHRP2. Here it is over here. This is the off card control. It's not quite as bright as the off card control, but it worked. We since got down to less than 1,000 copies. We're on our way down to 100 copies, and we think that's probably what our limit's going to be on the card. Um, Immunoassays. So the nucleic acid assay part is one part of the card. The other side of the card is, is, the, is the immunoassays where we're looking at antigens and antibodies. And this is the last part of the talk. Um, we're actually doing it two different ways. Micronics got started on one way, which was something they had done in-house, which I won't talk about much, but basically they're looking at dots of color on a flat piece of mylar where they've printed down capture molecules and we're in both cases, using a particular type of technology using something called tetramethylbenzidine, which turns dark blue in a chemical reaction. It's a really nice marker. We're doing the same thing, and I'm going to talk about our part of it more because, well, we're, I know much more about the details of what I'm doing than the details of what they're doing at Micronics. And this basically allows us to get blue spots on a porous membrane. It's a nitrocellulose membrane. Those of you, probably many of you are familiar with that. Um, real, this has about a 200, the part on the left has a 250 times larger surface area, so inherently it's more sensitive, okay? Um, 
We started out using essentially a 96 well plate format with a vacuum manifold and sucking things through a membrane, and we get blue dots that correspond to the amount of stuff on there. Um, we've sent, since gone to smaller membranes that are about the size of a business card, and as you'll see, we've gone to much smaller ones as well. Basically, we go through a relatively straightforward procedure like this, and we call this the flow-through membrane assay. This membrane is porous. It's got cavities through it that are um, basically, I think, 0.22 micron holes. What we're going to do is stack up a set of molecules, and I'm going to show you the stack that we use for the antigen detection. It's similar for the um, serology, but not exactly identical. So the first thing we do is we add a capture molecule, in this case an antibody, and stick it onto the membrane. We then block the rest of the places in the membrane, and we dry it out, and we store it. And we've shown that we can store these things at 40 degrees C for a long time. That's not new. That's how the lateral foam amino assays work. So we begged, or so we borrowed technology there. You add your sample, and the sample ought to have the antigen, the thing you're trying to capture, and it will get stuck. And if you've got more of it in the sample, more of it will be stuck. If you've got less, you can get down to zero. You rinse, then you add a labeled secondary antibody, which either has gold label, AU is gold, or horseradish peroxidase, or HRP, which is an enzyme. If you're going to label the gold one, you rinse, and you're done, and you have a red spot. If you've used the horseradish peroxidase, then you add what's called a chromogenic substrate, something that changes color. Um, and in that case, it reacts with the horseradish peroxidase, creating a blue color, which then precipitates and gets stuck on the membrane. So you end up with a blue spot on the membrane where you had capture. And then ideally, it's in some sense proportional to the amount of antigen that was in there. Um, why do we do this? Well, conventional amino assays done in 96 well plates can take a couple of hours. Sometimes they're relatively slow. They're pretty sensitive. They're pretty good, but they're slow. And we're basically pushing for speed here as much as possible. So the membranes actually allow us to do speed and allow us to get things done substantially faster with little dots on paper and often in very small spaces. This is the intermediate size that we've been working on. And this is a movie. Um, at this point, Paolo Spichata-Mihalic, my grad student, will bring a pipette up and will add the TMB solution. And you can see the blue spots show up immediately within you know, basically a second. And we're sucking the fluid through the membrane at a slow rate. And while it's being sucked through, you're getting more and more reaction. The spots are getting darker and darker blue. So this is basically done with a cheap webcam. Uh, it works really well. You don't need really sophisticated optics to see the spots, or even, for that matter, to compare the darkness of the spots. And this total assay time aim is less than 10 minutes, and that's easily achievable. We're actually doing it two ways just to make life complicated. This is the gold version with gold particles that are dark red. This is a very simple assay, but not as sensitive. With the TMB assay I just showed you, it's a little more complicated. Um, at first, we were actually very afraid we weren't going to be able to do it. And we discovered a really like a 1950s paper that figured out how to store horseradish peroxidase indefinitely. And we're really delighted. So we're actually thinking we can work easily with the horseradish peroxidase enzyme, which gives us the dark blue spots you see in the upper left. Um, does it work? Yeah, it works. These are the malarial tests, and these are examples of our response to noise or a signal to noise ratio. Um, the noise level or limit of detection, which is three times the noise level, is down here at this red line. So we're easily detecting six nanograms per ml of one of the assay or antigens from Plasmodium falciparum, and for the aldolase, which is another one from malarial um, parasites, at 13. This is an example of a test strip here with different concentrations. So it works. It's not linear, but it gives us a very nice graded response. We're printing things with our own printer. Basically, we've got an inkjet printer kind of like the one you have at home, but much more manually controlled than the one that prints out your uh, research papers. Um, we have a lot of sort of custom building. We've done it. But fundamentally, the idea is to use cheap inkjet printing as a way to print out a membrane with all of the reagents. And all we have to do is change inks, which means change reagents, so we can change different types of tests on the card. That's the goal. Um, these are just examples of some of the patterns we can do. The droplets we're working with are kind of small. It's kind of fun to be able to manipulate 15 picoliter droplets. Um, this is an example of sort of what happens when you vary the number of droplets on the surface and how dark the cat. Obviously, it isn't linear with the number of, of reagents, but it gives us a very nice graded range. And they can be very, very small. Um, it works both for, for the same assay, in this case, one done with the gold reagents, one done with the TMB on the same card at the same time. So we can multiplex not only different reagents in different places and different capture molecules, but even different ways of actually doing the measurement at the same time. 
We're also worried about dry reagents. We're actually stealing from, again, lateral flow immunoassay technology by putting reagents on basically fibrous pads and dropping them on there. These are the gold labeled secondary antibodies. And if you rinse them out, you can rinse out basically all of that stuff within a couple of seconds. So then have a bolus of your secondary reagents going downstream, which we'll show you in a second. And these can be dry stored, and they seem to store extremely well at long periods of time with appropriate amounts of sugar in them. Uh, we've been designing cards at a sort of furious pace in the last six months. This is one of the earlier ones from about four or five months ago now. This includes one of these pads for the secondary antibody. This is a gold labeled one, which we'll see in a minute. Here's the membrane which has the capture spots on it, all built into one of those plastic cards we showed you earlier. This one was built by us. And what I'll try to show is a movie of this thing actually working. Um, the movie is in real time, so it's not sped up. So this is where the capture spots are. What you're eventually going to see is this at the end, which is a series of spots. Notice they're not all the same density. It has to do with differential flow rates. So this is what it actually looks like when we run the thing. And you'll see a bunch of pink color, which is a solution of the secondary antibodies labeled with gold particles, which are dark red, as they flow across the membrane. And if we waited here, about three minutes down the road, you'd begin to see the spots getting dark. So we figure we've got about a four or five minute time for the development of the dark spots. And by the time you're done, you flush through all the pink color, the spots stand out really nicely. Um, and that's with this one, it's substantially faster with the blue ones. But this has now been integrated into a single functional card. Um, we're, as I said, the card development's going very, very rapidly right at the moment. This is the inner workings for one we finished working with about three weeks ago, which has a variety of cavities and different bits of plumbing that allow us to perform the antigen assays completely in biplex, or in fact, as many different antigens as you want it to detect at the same time. This is what the card actually looks like in the outside. Right now, we're working to integrate the antigen detection with the IgM detection on the same card, and we hope to have that done within the next month. So we'll get all six of our assays on the same card, even though they're one different ways. So where are we with this whole thing? Well, in the last two and a half years, some things have taken form. One is the form factor for the card. Here's the windows for the um, nucleic acid test over here. Here's the window where the cell phone camera is going to take a picture of the spots. The whole thing will be integrated into a single plastic card, and we've had some of the prototypes built of that. We've gone with an external laptop battery charger, which you charge up, and then you shove in one battery, and it'll run for about eight hours continuously, performing all the functions. We changed the, the, the box. It changed a bit. People said they'd rather shove in their cartridges from the side than the front. It's more stable. So literally, things like that influence the final design. We're talking to the users. They didn't want a lot of complicated stuff. They wanted their own languages, so we've got different languages. And very, very simple buttons, things like, oh, print. It turns out that almost everybody in India would have felt very uncomfortable if they did not have a piece of paper that described their test that they could themselves carry to the next person in the office. So, all the electronics in the world mean nothing if the end user wants a piece of paper. So we're going to have to have a printer that goes with this thing, even if the printer isn't built in. Those are the sorts of cultural things we've run into nonstop in the project. Um, of the five-year timeline, we're pretty much here in the middle, um, sort of mid-2008 now. Um, it will end at the end of 2008, so that we're actually now at the stage where we're just about to get the first prototype of the DX box in our hands at the end of this month. It's going to look like that. Again, there's the scale it being a pen and a pad. Um, we think it's pretty exciting. It does most of the things we thought it would do and basically some more. We had not realized, in a sense, just how critical getting nucleic acid tests out to the end of the food chain would be. It's really going to be very important. In a sense, people can do aminoassays crudely and slowly, but they can't do the nucleic acid test at all because they're places where you just can't imagine running a PCR thermal cycler at all. So that's going to be the really novel capability. Um, integrating that with the aminoassays, I think, is going to really make an exciting package. Um, we can do qualitative and quantitative aminoassays. At first, we're only going to be doing the, the qualitative ones, the yes-no answers, but we know that we can now do the qualitative ones very effectively. Um, we are only doing the first panel. Once we are ready to go, we can change the panels to different sets of diseases, and that's going to be very interesting. We found very clearly that some people care about three of those ones and don't give a hoot about the other three, so there are places where there's no reason to talk about dengue. By the way, we thought that Kasumu was one of the places one didn't care about dengue because there was no dengue in Kasumu. 
Turns out there is dengue in Kasumo. We proved it. We proved it with some of our clinical trials. We confirmed it now with three different tests in two different countries. So it turns out that even in the process of doing the, what I'll call, validation testing of the instrument function and the assay functions, we're already discovering things about rapidly spreading infectious diseases. Um, it's a platform. In effect, you've got a small microscope in there, which you could use for other purposes if you think about it as well. Um, yes, we want to have inexpensive disposables, and the aim is to have those disposables manufactured in the developing world at very low cost. That's definitely going to be where they'll be made in the long run, to keep the cost as low as possible. Um, you're going to eliminate the need for a lot of highly trained people to do this, which means people already in the field should be able to operate with this. It is both a low cost, but a fairly sophisticated instrument. Um, no need for continuous power. You can plug it in, plug in another laptop battery after eight hours and keep going, and in the end of the day, recharge these things off your 12-volt battery supply in your car. Um, and a really critical thing is to make it integratable with, with platforms or with the informatic systems that are rapidly developing, to, to take that model of using the cell phone as a way to get data in and out and use that to really bring information to the people who need to know about it wherever they are. Just to let you know, it's real. This was the shelves in January at Imbitech where they actually had all the parts sitting over there. Those are what the actual shelves look like in real time, and they're filled out now. The first one's been its last stages of testing before shipping to Seattle. I want to thank people in my group who are doing a lot of things. Some of these are on this project. Some of them aren't. And certainly, I want to thank many, many funding sources who helped us develop this microfluidic stuff going back 15 years and bring it to the point where we think we now are just ready to begin to take this thing out and really help some people with it. Thanks very much.